You know, Jesus Christ was human, but he was also God. He was limited by human manifestations, but at the same time, he was not limited by the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Ember. I'm Janice. This is Bible Discovery TV, taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every year. And it's very exciting doing that. This is our 31st year. And uh, as we do that today, we're in Mark 3. This is going to be interesting. And Corey's here to help us with Ryan. Corey, what's going on? Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Ryan? Today, I'm looking at the life of Simon Peter's brother and disciple of Christ, Andrew. Okay, very good. That's, that's going to be interesting. Janice? It's our fun Friday wrap up, and I'm going to ask a question based on our reading from Matthew 19 all the way through to Mark chapter 4. Very good. All right, get the Bible out. Let's open it up and see what God is saying. Mark 3, verses 7 through 27. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea and Jerusalem and Adumea and beyond the Jordan. And those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into a house. Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself, and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 27. Mark chapter 3 and 4, that's our reading assignment today as we continue with the Word of God. You've just read the passage that we've selected for focusing on today. Now, the spirit that hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, is the same spirit fully made known in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. When the Lord poured himself into human flesh, he willful, willfully limited himself to the flesh for a short period of 33 years. That according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. Jesus understood his human limitations were bound in flesh 
But wait a minute. But that the spirit, capital S, supersedes it. When Jesus healed people, he did so through the Holy Spirit. The evil spirits trembled in his presence. And this was no ordinary man, trust me. And everyone knew it. It's fascinating to think that Jesus spoke of spiritual war taking place all around us. Now, that's mentioned in Mark chapter 3, 22 to 30. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul talks about it. And to combat the enemy, we must receive the spirit, capital S, of adoption. And that would be the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple of scriptures here. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Our spirit is made holy through lifetime sanctification through his spirit. To reject his spirit is to ally yourself or make friends with Satan's spirit. And believe me, beloved, you do not want to do that. You are against Satan, as we are. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we look at the scripture and focus on this second gospel. And we're talking about the spirit of God. I love this one. This is the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of God has been here Jesus Christ is in Genesis chapter 1. The Holy Spirit is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God is in, I'll call over it. And uh, I'll tell you where Jesus Christ is. We've mentioned it a few times, but I'll tell you where he is later on. Right now, we're going to pray because we have to learn what the Spirit of God says. And this gets really interesting. Father, I pray today in Jesus' wonderful name that you would show us your way and teach us your path. Help us to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is right here right now. The Holy Spirit is right where you are right now. And the Holy Spirit is everywhere that he comes in and we praise God. We praise your name, Lord Jesus. And your spirit is here right now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Now, listen carefully as we read the scripture, Mark chapter 3, verse 7, okay? But Jesus withdrew his disciples to the sea. He pulled back. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. And Jerusalem and Idumea beyond the Jordan. And those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things, okay? When they heard how many things Jesus was doing came to him. So they just came from everywhere. Verse 9. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him, listen carefully, because of the multitudes, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Because Jesus was ministering. Beloved, listen. Jesus understood his human limitations, that they were bound in the flesh, and made provision through the Spirit. Okay, I'm going to read that again. I want you to listen to it and think about it. Jesus understood his human limitations bound in the flesh, and he made provision through the Holy Spirit. Okay? We too are limited in the flesh, and we must trust in God for our strength from the Holy Spirit. We have to trust in God, because the Holy Spirit is the one who does the healing. The Holy God is the one who does the work. He is Spirit. Beloved, we need to understand that. We need to recognize that. But we're running out of time, so let's go on. Chapter 3, verse 13. And when he went upon the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him, and then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. What's he going to do? And to have power to heal sickness. His disciples had the power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, whom he gave the names 
the Narragains, and also the Sons of Thunder. That's what it meant. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, and the Cain. Simon was the Canaanite, by the way. And Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into the house. Now, this is important to think about, okay? The ministry of Jesus was not limited by human flesh. Not limited by human flesh. The Spirit of God supersedes the physical world and prepares us for spiritual war as his children. You may not know this, and this is what I say to Gina, who play, prays with us on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Gina's a ninja warrior, man. I mean, she's a prayer ninja warrior. And what I mean by that is she's so skilled and talented in doing, in fighting the enemy. You became a spiritual warrior when you got saved. You may not feel like a warrior, but you are. Keep that in mind. All right. Let's get on to the last couple of verses because we're running out of time. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, the father of demons. And by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and he said to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? Jesus said. I mean, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. Come on, guys. He has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house unless and plunder his goods unless he first blinds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Once again, God is confronting them, beloved. Jesus was not out of his mind, but seemed so to those who had a hardened heart. Their heart was hard, his was not. When we give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive a heart of the Spirit, beloved. The Holy Spirit comes into our heart, which is our spirit, and revives us. I tell you, that is the most amazing thing. Because when your heart is revived by the Holy Spirit and you are born again, things leave you like burdens and anger and everything else. Because God has entered your spirit, things then begin to change. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now, you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And in today's report, I'm examining the life of Simon Peter's brother and disciple of Christ, Andrew. And the reason I want to bring a spotlight on Andrew today rather than on the more prominent Peter is because even though Andrew is often in the background, without the, his influence on his brother, Peter may have never followed Christ and the history of Christianity might have taken a very different path. So let's take some time to really get to know this biblical hero of faith. Andrew, one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ, though very much a behind the scenes disciple, carried out one of the most far reaching religious coups in all history. He convinced his hot headed independent domineering brother, Simon Peter, to follow Jesus. Had it not been for Andrew, the history of Christianity might have taken a very different path. It is difficult to contemplate this centuries old faith without the larger than life Simon, Andrew ever in the background. Originally, Andrew was a disciple of the desert prophet John the Baptist. But when Jesus arrived on the scene and John declared him the Lamb of God, Andrew's heart was stirred. He, along with another of John's disciples, followed Jesus home that day, and Andrew brings Simon Peter to Jesus. Apparently, it was sometime after this when Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and officially called Peter, Andrew, James, and John into discipleship and taught them to be fishers of people. This was very significant since Andrew was working alongside his brother, helping their father manage a prosperous fishing business. 
He was from Bethsaida, a place which means House of Fishing, located on the northeast coast of the Sea of Galilee. Also involved in the fishing business were James and John and their father Zebedee. Another of Jesus' disciples, Philip, was also from Bethsaida, and both he and Andrew bore Greek names, which could explain why they seem to be so closely connected. The first account of Andrew and Philip together is at the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus sees the hungry crowd, he asks Philip where bread might be bought. Philip replies, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. However, Andrew interjects that there is a boy who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Jesus, of course, subsequently feeds to the full the entire multitude with this small meal. Andrew and Philip also appear together in John chapter 12. When a group of Greeks come to the feast of Passover during Jesus' final week, they approach Philip and request to see Jesus. Philip tells Andrew and together they inform Jesus. This account suggests that both Philip and Andrew spoke Greek. As author Ruth Tucker observes, Andrew, more than the other disciples, brings people to Jesus. First his brother, then the boy with the bag lunch, and finally at the Passover dinner, when he escorts a delegation of Gentiles to meet his master. Andrew is faithful to his calling, the quiet man in the back pew who does little more than simply bring people to Jesus. Andrew would also have the privilege of being one of only four men to be given inside information about the end of time. Indeed, in a private meeting, now known famously as the Olivet Discourse, Jesus revealed the future to Peter, Andrew, James, and John. You know, personally, I really, really appreciate Andrew and those godly saints like him because although they're often overlooked, they're really important and I would even say critical for the mission of God. I mean, just think of Andrew's influence on Peter who founded the church. Remove Andrew's influence and who knows what would have happened. So remember, if you're someone who serves God behind the scenes, then you need to know that you are just as important and critical to God's kingdom and those who, as those who are in public view. Take it from Andrew. Be encouraged. I think that a lot of people have focused on the Greek style where, and churches today are focused on the Greek style because they, they go to a place where a lot of people are and someone gets up in front of them and articulates and tells them everything they need to know. But a synagogue was not that way. It's true. And teaching, Jesus Christ teaching was not that way. So a lot of people think, well, he's the pastor and the pastor is telling everybody, well, he's the shepherd, which is different than a leader that uh, runs everybody's life. He's somebody who serves and somebody who helps. And I think that becomes important to remember. There are many ushers. I got to tell you this story. It's a great story. One of the ushers in a church that we go to is uh, somebody who used to have the fear of people. And he used to sit in the back and just come a little bit late, leave a little bit early because he was afraid of people. Today, he's a head usher. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And I think, oh my goodness, God has done amazing things. And he is so, he's in my Bible study. He's such a spot on person. And uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, it's very interesting. So mm. behind the scenes is not something to you know, make fun of. It's very, very important. Thank you, Ryan. Mm. Corey? All right. Well, we're wrapping up our series, taking a look at the, you know, today places that claim to be the um, tomb of Jesus Christ. So the tomb that Jesus was placed in, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So today we're focusing in on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because yesterday on that program, we took a look at the garden tomb. So let's get started. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is located in the busy Christian quarter within the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Behind the church's claim to be built over top of the crucifixion site of Jesus and his rock-cut tomb is a couple thousand years of Christian history. Against it seems to be its location within the walls of the old city, and perhaps it's a millennia of Christian veneration that has led to a mishmash of confusing architecture. To the problem of its location, it is known from the records of Josephus that during the time of Christ, this area was outside of the city walls, but shortly after was incorporated into the city by Herod Agrippa's so-called Third Wall. 
Archaeological excavations conducted in the 1960s have demonstrated that the church area, long before Agrippa or the New Testament, back in the time of the kings of Judah, was once a limestone quarry. This quarry was then repurposed as a cemetery in the first century BC before being incorporated into the city proper by Agrippa. In AD 135, Roman Emperor Hadrian suppressed a Jewish rebellion, expelled Jews from Jerusalem, renamed Jerusalem and all of Judea for that matter. Over the quarry turned cemetery turned city, he built a huge raised platform filled in with dirt and a temple dedicated to Venus. The area was completely and thoroughly covered. The story of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre picks up again in the 4th century AD with the mother of Christian Emperor Constantine. During her pilgrimage to Jerusalem, Christians living there showed her the site, identifying it as the location of Golgotha and the tomb Christ had been laid in. The area was promptly cleared of any remains of Hadrian's temple, and a few hundred years after its burial, the quarry turned graveyard was unearthed. Constantine built a rotunda around the tomb Christians identified as Jesus's and a basilica where Christians could worship and pray. Since the 4th century, there have been many upgrades, switches of power, a few fires and restoration projects to get us to where we are today, nearly 2,000 years later. But the truly intriguing prospect of the Holy Sepulchre that makes it stand out among other sites is that Christians living in Jerusalem had a preserved tradition of where Golgotha and Christ's tomb was. The Christian church had lasted in Jerusalem all that time without interrupted leadership. 200 years after the site had been buried by Hadrian, they successfully predicted a first century graveyard would be under the pagan temple. Was it a lucky guess? Even in their day, the location would have seemed an unlikely spot. It was inside their current day walls and underneath a man-made platform that held a temple of Venus. It of course can't be proven archaeologically that the venerated tomb of Christ actually was the tomb Joseph of Arimathea gave to the Lord. But the place fits and the early Christian tradition is impressive. I hope you found this series, this three-day series on these sites that claim to be the site of Jesus's tomb. I hope you found it interesting. Now, uh, one thing that I just want to point out is that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which one of these sites contains the, you know, or if any of them contain the original remains of the tomb of Jesus Christ, because he's not there. And is it a cool thing to be able to go to the to Israel, to the Holy Land and, and find all of the physical places? Yes, it can be extremely instructive in, you know, being able to see where Jesus actually gave the Sermon on the Mount and things of that nature. But Christianity can be practiced anywhere in the world, not just in Israel. We don't have to be pilgrims to specific places. We have to go to God. That's what's required. And that's one of the revolutionary things about Christianity is that no matter who you are, no matter what culture you come from, no matter what the politics of your region are, it doesn't matter. You can still be a faithful Christian because all it requires is that you put Jesus as the Lord of your life. So you treat others with respect and with love that flows from your respect and your love for God. So that's just something that I wanted to tag on here at the end of looking at some of these sites. That's very good. Mm -hmm. That's very good. I've been to Israel several times and I understand that because so many people they come there and they make a religion out of worshiping the items. And you don't worship mm -hmm. the items, you worship God. Mm -hmm. That's like when people have a cross with Jesus crucified on it. I, you know, that's no problem, but, but I don't recognize it that. It can be because, instructive. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I, I recognize Jesus in heaven at the right hand of the Father and his right. Holy Spirit is here now. And so that's what I recognize. So it's very, very interesting. That's fascinating. Corey, what did you do for the weekend? Right, okay, so I have a YouTube channel uh, that's just my name, Corey Babechko, and every Saturday I upload a chapter by chapter recap of our assigned reading. This is in case you get behind or you've read so much that you can't remember what it is that you read. We do a recap uh, to just get you caught back up and get the scriptures solidified in your mind so that you can be set up to go on Monday and uh, continue reading through the Bible. Very good, Janice. All right. Well, we have our question, our fun Friday wrap up. And um, 
it was anywhere from Matthew 19 all right. the way through to Mark 4. So here is the question, and it's coming from the book of Mark. Okay. Who were the sons of Zebedee? Hmm. Was it James and John? Was it Simon, Peter, and Andrew? Or was it Matthew and Thomas? Now I can hear the wheels turning of our friends at home <laughs> who love to play along with this game. And it's, you know, you might have the wrong answer, but there's really never a wrong, wrong answer because when you up. have a wrong answer, that's right, it's always an open book test, except for you two. <laughs> except for us. Except for you that's two. That's all right. And, um, and then if you get it wrong, and for years we did this together, you and I, and, and I got lots a lot of, of times wrong. you got them wrong, but the next year, if I changed it or brought it forward again, you got it right. So there you go. Okay, so who were the sons of Zebedee? Was it James and John, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, or Matthew and Thomas? What say you two? That would be James and John. Yes. And you agree? Definitely. And what about Absolutely. you, Dad? Are you thinking the same? Yeah, I'm thinking James and John. All right. Well, if you agreed with that answer, at home, you're absolutely right. Mark 1, verse 19, when he had gone, this is Jesus, when Jesus had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. Look forward to that on the next program. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 through 5. It's going to be very interesting. Or excuse me, Mark chapter 9 through 10. It's going to be very interesting. So join us as we do that. Let's pray. At the end of the program, we always talk about prayer. And reminder that our prayer meetings are on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3.30 Eastern on Facebook, YouTube, and of course, Bible Discovery. Join us if you can. But today we pray, Lord, are you there? Because you alone are holy and you alone have made me holy. And I will follow you with all my life, even though I sometimes don't feel holy. It's not what I feel but it's what you made me that counts. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.